Thanks for tuning in to the Replatform Podcast, sponsored by Hypersonics on the Track, hosted by me, James Gett, and Paul Rogers. Uh, warm welcome. It's your first episode. We put a lot of time and effort into bringing you amazing guests and great content all for free. Uh, help us keep it that way. Refer us to other people in your network. Tell other people you exist and let them know what you like about the podcast. Share our posts on LinkedIn uh, and Twitter. Give us a bit of amplification. And the best thing you can do is rate our show on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever else you're listening um, or watching it and tell others to rate us because that really does help with our visibility. So let's set up our, our latest episode and introduce you to our guest. Um, so I was lucky enough to to host a panel at um, Paul's recent Pulse event with today's guest, Tim. Um, and the Bottle Club uh, is a multi-brand e-commerce store, sells, I think it was around 10,000 different alcohol products. It's a dangerous place if you love whiskies. I've noticed that. Um, it's achieved considerable growth in the last few years. Paul's worked with them for, for many years. Uh, as I said, I really enjoyed um, the panel session with uh, talking to Tim about product discovery and multi-brand. So we're going to expand a bit more on that and other topics today. So warm welcome, Tim, um, who's the head of e-commerce in the Bottle Club. Oh, nice to meet you. Nice to see you guys. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, I'll tell you what, before we start asking you all the annoying questions, do you want to give people a bit of a flavour for who you are, your background, what brought you to the Bottle Club? Yeah, so um, I've been... Um, running the bottle club for like three years now. Um, I came in originally from a design background. Um, alcohol can often be quite a stuffy uh, category, and you know, with like the connoisseurs and whiskey experts and wine connoisseurs and things. So um, we we rebranded the bottle club from what it was previously to this kind of more modern um, interpretation, uh, taking as- like aspects from lifestyle brands like I saw it first, ASOS, misguided. Um, and then using that to then obviously sell alcohol instead of clothes. And I think it, we've we've found a niche within um, within that market um, while still selling the same products as everybody else. Great. Um, so I'll ask the first question. Um, so the Bottle Club has grown considerably over the last two to three years. So since you've been involved, so I was uh, I worked at the Bottle Club pre you, and it was really small. And then obviously, since you joined, and there's a bit more of a strategy behind it, and then obviously the pandemic, um, yeah, it's grown really fast. Um, so what has driven that growth? Yeah, I think COVID was obviously one of the biggest drivers. E-commerce boomed and so did alcohol retail. Um, when the bars and restaurants were closed, everybody still wanted to drink. They wanted to go and find um, those products from somewhere else. Um, and another big thing for us, which we talked in the, in the summit about, is that um, – Many of the grocers only sell a couple of products from from the bigger brands like Hennessy or Glen Ranji or Jack Daniels. So they only sell three or four products by, by each. Uh, whereas what we do is we kind of grow um, with the consumer and as they kind of build an affinity to a brand and the, to the category, they can expand. And we've got 12 Jack Daniels, for example, instead of four, we've got 15 different Glen Ranjis versus the two that they sell in Tesco's. So that's been a big driver for us. Access and Google shopping and people looking for those products and then and getting growing with us um and then we've also we're also always trialing things so we're always looking for the, the next way of finding a new customer or getting and having a conversation with somebody that we wouldn't have necessarily had before so we've partnered with obich and ibs that's a group of events and you know that's that's kind of fits our audience and then we've done things like spotify ads and some of them have landed as well as um, as others, we did Word Seed, which was yeah really great curation of products. We just had the wrong audience for the for the area, um, and then we've just partnered with a supercar network of like high net worth individuals for like our top end clients. So we're always just trying to find new ways of getting in front of new people. And then the other big part of it is that we've kind of had a focus over the last couple of years around four key metrics, which is you know, AOV and IPT, um, but also um, trying to eradicate shipping loss which obviously you know is a big thing within e-commerce um because it's so hard to ship things and then also our margin so alcohol margins are particularly great so working on how we can um be more efficient in it and what we're selling and all of those things have enabled us to grow more and more throughout the last um two or three years so our growth is probably almost 16 times what it was in 2019 now so it's it's been a journey we've learned a lot along the way but um it's been good Right. Yeah, I think that um, that test and learn piece definitely makes you guys a great client. Like every time you come into our office, which is almost too often, um, you know, you've got about 15 new ideas. And uh, yeah, I think that, that keeps things exciting. 
Um, yeah. And I guess, so you touched on this a little bit, but the big challenge with multi-brand, particularly nowadays, is kind of customer acquisition costs have gone up and, you know, a lot of the big channels have become more expensive. Um, so the big challenge is scaling acquisition without the margin that a brand might typically have. Um, so how have you kind of got around this? Um, what's your strategy here? Yeah, I think one of the, the things we find the hardest is, as a as a multi brand retailer, it's kind of what we talked about with, with Sports Edit and the term as well. That when you're a multi brand retailer, if you were to put a billboard up on you know Miller Box Street, I'll pick the circus with a bottle of Johnny Walker, all that does is drive traffic towards the product or the brand, not where to buy it from. And that's been a real struggle for us. So the growth came a lot around shopping. Um, people know, having an intent, knowing what product they wanted, us having the best price and having a really strong performance marketing team to um to optimize all of the all of the cat, uh, catalogs for that um so that that's how we've acquired a lot of customers um but then also a massive driver for us as well has always been affiliates um it, you when we were first doing affiliates it was very much the dirty side of you know customer acquisition and it was always the discounters and um you know commissions and um you call it cash back size like, like, cash back size like quick co and uh, amex um, but now everyone starts to see that it's actually a brilliant way of um, of acquiring new customers. And it actually isn't that bad in terms of cost of sale. Like you're obviously setting a percentage of your commission, but that's probably in a lot of cases better uh, and more efficient value than what you spend on paid um, from a shopping perspective at least. Um, and then because of the number of products we've had, we've had a big focus on organic um, and making sure that the pages are categorized correctly and, um, and the, the product detail and the data that we had because when I think we first started working with you uh, you guys were like your data is shocking like how do you anyone navigate your site um, and we did a whole piece about like learning tax like building the taxonomy for our products where do they sit how do they sit um, and how does somebody navigate to what they want and how do we service a request of someone that knows exactly what they want or someone that's quite agnostic or quite, you know, they're buying a gift for their father, doesn't know what whiskey, they're just going to see all whiskey. But if you know what you want, you can go further down into the journey. Um, and then, it, as I say, I was looking for new channels as well. So anything that pops up, um, Rubiera, um, the supercar uh, company that we're looking at, has been great for getting in front of um, small networks, but really high net worth, targeted people that want to spend a lot of money on site, and want to have some of the best um, and rarest products. Uh, we've just launched a whole collection called the Seller Collection um, that is a kind of curation of not only limited editions, but all rare rarities, back, back vintages. Um, it's just a cool curation of products. And we also do a lot of um, import as well. So we'll import products from the US, so making sure that the customer gets to have the latest and greatest in alcohol um, from us, that we're, we're the go-to guys to go and get those products. So that's how we've we've kind of nailed that um, customer acquisition piece. Attract, your complete product discovery growth engine. Create relevant shopping experiences that convert into sales and grow online revenue with personalized search, merchandising and recommendation solutions powered by AI. Find out more at attract.com. And um, you, you mentioned, we also talked about, I think, um, around the panel event about using contribution margin within marketing activity and merchandising. Can you talk us through how this works and like, you know, how you're using it basically and where you're using it yeah so it's um we've been doing it for the last five months i think it is uh where we've got rid of um product category um collections within shopping um and we're using margin buckets instead because that way we can be more aggressive if you've got you know one whiskey that's got 50 percent margin and you've got one whiskey that's got 10 percent margin you're not able to spend 10 percent cost of sale on both of those items um, but also, if you just set a blanket rule for all whiskey, then you're actually detrimenting the sales of the higher margin and then, you know, overspending on the other. So, um, moving them into the margin brackets um, has been a really um, strong driver for us to to be able to spend more efficiently and harder on, on products that we can, um, being more visible. And again, that's always about, um, I always call it more hooks in the water. So, the more hooks in the water, the more visible we are, the more fish we can catch. Um, and that's always why we've always added more products and tried to expand that portfolio from 1,200 products to 10,000. So there's, we've got an answer to everybody's question. And I know, um, I know you've been on Shopify Plus for a, f 
a few years. I think Paul mentioned about four years, is it now? Um, we've done lots of podcasts with lots of brands, you know, a lot of people on Shopify, people on different platforms. And the, the bit that we always love to find out is the tech stack around the core platform. Can you talk us a bit uh, through like the end-to-end tech stack? You know, what else are you using around Shopify? How much of it is Shopify's ecosystem like the apps versus other third-party specialist systems? Yeah, so we we moved away from shop, um, a lot of Shopify's native functionality because we wanted to really expand how, how strong our offering was as a platform. Um, so we actually use um, Algolia for our search and match. Um, so all of our collections are powered by Algolia. Um, which has actually enabled a lot more customization and functionality um, than what would have necessarily been in, in, in Shopify, especially from a merchandising perspective. Um, we've then built um, PIM um, using Akinia, uh, which has been great for getting that data trip. Um, what's really cool that we've done with the PIM, uh, what the PIM has enabled, I should say, is that uh, we use an app called Better Reports, um, which is brilliant app, one of the best apps I think on Shopify, on Shopify um, because I use it every day. Um, and what having the right tags does is it unlocks information. So say we've been selling, you know, 50 different bottles of whiskey for the last five years, but there was no tags on it. You can just report on the product ID or, you know, a category. But as you start adding tags, you can start discovering trends and more data that, from historic sales than you would have done originally. So we added on Isla Whiskey and it has a cork and it has, um, it's a glass bottle and it's this size. And then we were able to report, actually, we're seeing a trend up in Isla Whiskey versus uh, Isla Whiskey's gone down, for example, uh, rather than just seeing whiskey growing. Um, so that's a really interesting and powerful way um, that we what we've gained from the PIM. Uh, we've got Yotpo for reuse um, and uh, UGC. And uh, we also got SNS Bum um, that we're just kind of rolling out slowly. And um, Flavio for our email database and our CRM, which is, you know, is the best one um, I've ever, ever used. And we've, we went when we first moved, we had 60,000 followers and 60,000 people in our database. We've got like 800,000 people now. Um, Paul hates how we got them, but we use Wheelio um, on the site and it, it's not on brand, it's not pretty, but it is a brilliant tool for customer acquisition um, or at least getting people into your database. And then our, our content that we send out emails is really strong. So they, they perform really well. We've got a really good engaged database um, and the sales that go through the email platform are really strong. Um, we've then got Rebuy. Um, we've basically launched a four-tier approach to upselling um, because of the, like how wide our category is. We've got minis, we've got barware, we've got cases. So on a PDP, we have um, the larger upsells, so then yeah, upsell to a case or have it as a bundle and buy five or six different products. If they're not interested in that level of upsell, then when they add to cart, they're then seeing products that are similar um, category or brand to that the product they put in. Um, so that just, it may be want to add another bottle of Ciroc or another bottle of rum to your order um, that you might not have already known about. And then we've got in cart, we've got um, mixers and barware. So things that are appropriate to buy a bottle of wine, it's going to upsell you um, some nice wine glasses or a, a corkscrew or something similar to that. And then you get into kind of lower stuff in, in checkout. Well, we sell vape, so we, we sell a lot of vape through the checkout as a kind of add on purchase. Um, but we also do a little bit more targeted things around um, you know, cheaper, cheaper court screws, cheaper barware, little accessories, wine, wine charms, um, just to add, get that basket spend up a little bit more. Um, better reports, as I said, brilliant app. Um, I don't I wouldn't say it's in a text app, but it's something that we use every day for everything. Um, and the way that it spits out reports as a schedule into Google Sheets, and then you can start using those to leverage um, other reports, which uh, I can go, go into more detail. Um, the bought census app is really strong. Um, we've, because it's straight after purchase, people are able to um, actually engage with it rather than if you were to have a survey on site, people might say, not going to do that. Because they're purchasing it, we ask just a couple of questions. And we've got really actual insights out of it. So we recently found out that over 50% of our orders are for gifts. We asked, you know, what's, who are you buying for? Are you buying for yourself? Are you buying for gifts? Are you buying for work? And the overwhelming proportion was was gifting, uh, which is then put onto our roadmap that we need to make sure that our gift offering is as good as possible. We've just launched a new gift menu on site because of the insights that we've gained from census. Um, and then I'm obviously a massive nerd as well. So we were at some of the early adopters of like ChatGPT and we had Jarvis that used to be 
that is now Jasper for all of our product descriptions. I'm trying to use AI to kind of automate as much as we can. And we're quite a small team, so anywhere we can leverage AI to take over as much of the work as possible, we will. Um, and it's been really good. And we've also started a trend of chat GPT cocktails. Um, so we've got we've built a recipe library of cocktails on site, and we're building a bunch of them that all been generated by by chat GPT. And we'll say, uh, make us a cocktail using Bombay Sapphire, and it'll come up with three different options, and then we'll pick one and then kind of refine it a little bit in terms of my tone of voice. Um, so that's been a really fun little project. Uh, Great. Also, yep. the ones, uh, the map. So we're just in the process of building a map um, for product discoverability. Um, I think there's the way that people shop and discover brands. Um, a lot of cases, the grocery where you go and just pick the whiskey you haven't had before, for example. Um, but we sell Australian whiskey, we sell um, German whiskey, French whiskey. Um, Danish whiskey, things that you wouldn't have necessarily known were a producer of that. Um, and obviously you've got your vineyards. Things. One for people who've already been to a place but want to find where it was or people that want to buy from the category but want to know from different areas. Um, it's a real cool way to to find new products. So that's the, the kind of basis of our, of our business. Hypersonics helps e-commerce companies make more profit every day. This AI-driven platform delivers recommendations for pricing and inventory that lead to bigger profits. Visit hypersonics.ai forward slash podcast to get a free trial. Great. Um, yeah, the Wheelio one was very annoying because uh, Census has, you know, had a number of flags from customers and Liam and I really pressed to get rid of that thing that unfortunately somehow the data proved us very much wrong. Um, so yeah, that, that remains annoyingly. Um, so on the PIM, so you touched on the PIM and you talked about a few benefits, but I guess beyond some of that stuff, it's really helped you from a, I guess, um, utilization of internal resources and, you know, some of the automation stuff you've done has been really beneficial. Um, so can you talk us through kind of, yeah, how, how you're using the Kinyo and yeah, is it a free version, premium version? Yeah. Just talk us through that a little bit. So it's the free version. Uh, we've got it hosted on the DigitalOcean server. Um, and we have a, a, a freelance developer that just got on and that platform. Um, we know it's keeping it pretty well. Um, we gave him a pretty savage brief when we started it. It's like, this is what we wanted to do. These are all the factors we want to have. Um, obviously, you can imagine the amount of potential detail that can sit on any any product, any amount of products at any one time. So we've had to build families and obviously from the white family we're talking about grapes and vintages and ages and how it was stored does it have a core whereas in spirits you're talking about the taxonomy of where does it sit within spirits because spirits can go into five different categories and they've got five different categories and it just gets further down um so it's been instrumental for taxonomy collection organization um and and filtering so algorithm is great at filtering but it needs something to filter against so building structured data um, that can then be looked up as as information rather than just some of the native fields within Shopify has just made it so much easier to navigate um, our site. And when we were managing you know, just 1,200 products manually without a PIM, having to remember to put this tag on, I'll duplicate this product, and then adding, copying the tags over from somewhere else, it was, it was unmanageable for the amount of things that we wanted to be able to do. Um, so building on it and adding that data um, is, has powered the entire the entire site really um the data validation is the other thing so you can't because we want it to be so structured and have the bread like fake bread problems that shopify doesn't like for, for organic and seo um we have like our tier system and the tiers you select spirits and then the only options below that are these following spirits rather you can't handle spirits but then put up med wine and then something else so it's being really accurate, really focused, and then you also you can't push the product live to site until there's a certain level of mandatory fields completed to make sure that you're never putting something inadequate live on site. Yeah, really like yeah, I, I, I think it's been really yeah, it's de it was definitely we've definitely seen a noticeable improvement in like the quality of data and you know less mistakes and less product being pushed live with you know minimal data etc so yeah i think that's been really good and then um i guess on uh kind of product discoverability you've talked a bit around your range and you've obviously got a lot of SKUs on the site 
Um, you touched on Algolia, but can you just talk a bit more around kind of how it's helped you from a collection merchandising perspective? Yeah. Um, so when we first got Algolia, I think Algolia out of the box wasn't wasn't great, if I'm honest. Um, we we were only using click and conversion data. Um, and what that did is any product that didn't particularly land well when it was loaded would just get further and further and further down the, down the collection. And obviously we've got over 550 gins, for example. And one example I use is there's a product called Bombay Premier Crew Gin. And when they launched it, they didn't launch it particularly well. It didn't land very well. The price book was a little bit off. Um, and it didn't, it didn't sell. But within about a month, it had gone from being position once it was the realist to being on like page seven. And no one was going to ever find out about it. So what we um, basically have built is what we call the smart merch tool. Um, and that takes in five metrics um, around inventory value, um, weeks of sale, and margin, and basically scores every product. And then that gets pushed back into Algolia to re-merchandise. So it means that we're not losing products that we need to push. We're able to be smarter about what's in position or what people are seeing first. And it's regularly changing daily um, with the latest scores and how it's selling and inventory and everything else. Um, so if you've got something that's got really high value, um, stock value, and you've got loads of units of it and you've got good margin on it and you haven't sold any for a couple of weeks, that's going to be at the top. And then if you've got something you've only got one arm for it, the margin's pretty poor, it's just going to bring itself down the, down the list so it's not as, as important to, to push. Um, and then, yeah, that's managed through Algolia looking at this just a mess of it. Um, and then we have um, what we call the Boost Collection, which is an additional collection um, that just sits in Shopify that manages liquid. Um, you add the products to it, and Algonia looks that collection. So any product that is in there that is in the collection that you're in, we prioritize to the top of the page. Just as I said, these are our focus products, regardless of what you're in. So we want to push Premier Crew, we put it in the Boost Collection. That will be because it's a legend page and the, the London Dry Gin page. It goes to position one or higher up if you know what I mean um, and that's enabled us to make so many more products visible to customers other than just best sellers um, as, you, as you can imagine there's too many products for us to manually merchandise and um, prioritize so this is both of those tools have enabled us to kind of not AI but kind of leave it to do its thing and it's just improved our margin dramatically uh, I think it's a 30% increase in margin since launching smart merchandising it plus the margin um Bucketing in, in shopping. We've seen a greater range of like an increase in AOV, increase in IPT. So it's proved a really powerful uh, functionality for us. But we have had to learn as we go with our goal. Our goal can do so many things. And from a search perspective, we probably might even scratch the surface, um, especially with like contextual searches and non strength um, queries uh, we haven't focused on. But um, it's been a powerful like, backbone for the, for the business. Yeah, I, th I think with search, it, it's when you get a powerful tool, realizing that when you have that those extra hours to be able to look into not just your core queries, and the especially around um, I think around some of the peak where you just get a real real surge and you get more of the long tail queries that normally are just like you know what there's too small volume to worry about. It's very interesting to realize how many dead ends there are. Every single e-commerce site out there has such dead ends. So. Um, Intriguing, intriguing to have this conversation maybe 12 months and see how that might change. But um, a podcast wouldn't be a one podcast thing I've got to add. Yeah, go for it. Well, the, well, one thing I've got to add is we've um, rebuilt our um, search drop down as well. So we have been able to prioritize the products that we're pushing within that search as soon as you open it. Um, and then we've also, because we've got so many categories, products, and runs, we've been able to. Um, use that data for the search. So if you were to search for Hennessy, you might be just showing 10 products of Hennessy. It also shows you in the right hand side, the Hennessy collection, the Hennessy brand. And then also we've got our recipe library. So then any, any recipe that contains Hennessy or cognac is then being um, shown in that search as well, which is great for discoverability. And then they've also, we've also enabled um, like an ad block, basically at the bottom of the search career for certain search queries. Uh, we can make it display uh, an image. So it's advertising space or um, activation opportunity for our brands, which um, is a big part of our, our business. So if you were search to search for Glenmorangie or Highland whiskey right now, then the Glenmorangie sub banner would fit at the bottom of the search bar. So that's been great for somebody that's not really sure what they're looking for. It's yeah. showing them something sooner. 
Yeah, I know. Search results pages are so underused in terms of testing opportunities. So it's really good to hear that you're you're using the tool, but also thinking about other user journeys you can get people into product discovery. So it's not because you see so many searches which just end up people leave search and they either leave the site or they go into like browse because they can't find what they want. So they're interested. Um, my next question is around like everyone talks about the economy. It came up at, at the event and uh, the event I was at yesterday, a tracks conference was the same. Love to hear your perspective on it because people talk about increasing prices, pressures, you know, the, the um, ch- you know, struggle with margins and profitability. Like what, what are the key things you're seeing in your industry? And like what are some things that you're trying to tackle on site, I guess, to, to, to handle the, the macro influences? Um, out of stocks is an issue for us at the moment. We do have a lot of products that we just, they're either the allocation is really small or access is difficult or timings are really slow. Um, that, well, there is also price increases across the board, even in some like soft drinks, again, you know, regular price increases, which is, is a struggle. I think everybody is aware of it. And for us, we sit in a funny space because what we call off trade alcohol retail versus the on trade, which is bars and restaurants where our prices are considerably lower. So if you were to buy a bottle of champagne at a bar, you can buy a case of champagne probably at the same price, um, from us. Um, so there is a pinch in terms of our pricing is going up, but actually we gain customers because they're, the price has gone up in the bars and restaurants as well. They're going to actually have to buy and this at home. Um, so that's kind of swings around the bounce, um, in terms of cost of living. Um, allocation of stock is, is one of the biggest issues. So we've got quite a lot of products out of stock at the moment, which is a constant struggle for the, for our buyers to try and source, you know, even the brand owners don't have all of the stuff that we require. So. We're trying to find other, other areas, and as I say, we do a lot of imports. Um, and then with the smart merchandising tool we talked about, what that's helped us to not hide, but kind of those out of stock products that would be quite noticeable normally go further down the page. And there's always a product or something that's relevant to make it to answer the question if the thing that they're not looking for is there. Um, so we, we're, we've been with managed to capitalize on it, I think, but it had, that is one of our, our main struggles. And then the one that we always deal with is just advertising restrictions. So both vape, which we sell a lot of on site and then alcohol, both come with severe alcohol, um, advertising restrictions and can't do Google display, for example, for, for alcohol, you can't do pay, um, kind of the shopping Instagram. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot of things that we can't do that if we were a, like a fashion brand or a well brand or something else would be a lot easier to. To, to be visible for, but we've picked the two most difficult um, industries to be in, do at the same time. So, and then that's been mad. It's been hard. Yeah, interesting. The, um, the Crown Peak um, uh, attract conference yesterday in London, a lot of uh, conversation came up amongst retailers about stock and peak and stock planning and and prioritizing um, I, uh, good stock uh, positions over those where there may be less reliability over replenishment. Uh, I think it's a common challenge. Um, another question I've got is: it, it, it strikes me that that you that Bottle Club has done a hell of a lot of work around new features and improving the front end with quite a lean team. I'd love to know because yeah. everyone wants practical stuff. Like, you know, what did people do? How did it work? Can you give us a few examples of things that you have done, whether it's a feature or improvements, and, and what impact it had? Yeah, so those are the smart, the smart version we've kind of already covered. So that's been a big driver. Um, we gained a lot of um, organic visibility from um, really focused on search consoles and going through search console, going through Ahrefs, checking for any kind of SEO related errors and trying to, to nail the, the cleanliness of those pages and the experience being as good as possible. So we've done a lot of work around internal linking. We've obviously got the recipes on site, which has been one great for upselling additional products to basket for the product that they're on, but it's also been great to drive into blog content and then be, you know, be acquired from a, a an informational query, like how do I make a porn star martini, but then actually ended up in the commerce, you know, transactional, um, scenario because of that journey from the recipe to the product. Um, and that structure and internal breadcrumbs has been massive for, for search console. Um, deals obviously always you to stay on top of it you can easily make one small error and it have a dramatic impact in your search console number that we once turned off a collection that was linked in the navigation so we had like ten thousand errors uh within about 20 minutes because 
it was four or four on game for everybody. Um, so search console, brilliant tool for, um, for keeping on top of, of that for organic. Um, we have got render better on site now 2.0. Um, and that's made a massive impact on, um, core web vitals. So it's an optimization speed platform. Um, it originally was just dedicated straight to code, but now it's actually got a sub, um, subdomain that it runs off. Um, and it has made a dramatic, in, dramatic impact into our own performance. Our old site used to be dead slow or used to moan about it all the time. And now it's, I think, I think at one point you said it's one of your fastest sites. In the uh, in Shopify, in our partner account, they benchmark uh, performance scores, and I think you're fastest. You're the highest. I'd, I'd love to know. It's been massive for that. I'd love to know, like, what what has it done? Because speed, the the um, the trade off between like making everything faster, but not screwing up your your customer experience by stripping out you know important customer features, is one thing that a lot of retailers are struggle with, and. Yeah, apart from the obvious things, i.e. Like minimization, compression, optimizing images. Are there any key things it's done that that, that surprise you in terms of like, wow, didn't realize that was going to have such an impact? Yeah, I don't, I, mean, I, I don't know I can give an example of what what it's done, but it, 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 it cleans up all of our CSS and it's always constantly optimizing every time somebody loads on page. One of the, what I was going to add to that, one of the biggest things it does is um, it likes some conscious third-party JavaScript. Um, so it's kind of similar to Yotta. Um, if yeah. you ever looked, at, I, we had them on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then there, there's also a lot of work to like reduce the impact of kind of JavaScript that you're not using as part of at that time. Um, and then they do a lot of work around assets as well, don't they? And they kind of host certain assets on that subdomain um but there they spend a lot of time on it as well they've got quite a good service around just their kind of core product um and yeah do, and i think so it got they do a bit of development as well so if they see an optimization that, that we could be making as well it's not just the, the app and platform that does it there's also a team behind and go well you know if you did this you'd actually be able to include improvement score there or this this one app is actually sucking some of your performance out so we've actually rebuilt um, the rebuy widget, for example. We, we use a rebuy for the logic behind it, the data set. We're serving our own widget, and that's made a big impact because we're already pulling the CSS that's already loaded straight into the, in, just onto the face. And I think the thing with your site as well, because you use so many third parties, like there are a lot of third parties, there is a lot of third-party JavaScript, um, and you know there's a lot of videos and things like that. So it, it's pretty quick, I think, now, all things considered. And then the other thing you just said back on the question about the new features with with um the PIM um and the stripped data, we've like focused on the navigation. So we've got a uh, really detailed navigation structure of the all fit, fits the taxonomy, but we've also got lifestyle images within there trying to promote products in in each of its individual categories. Um it just for us it's great because we know how hard it was to navigate previously. So we're really proud of now that you can go on the site and get to exactly where you want to get to um, because of the navigation and the taxonomy that we've built and the breadcrumbs in which, you know, the organization that, um, then we've got their upsell strategy um, that we talked about. That's been, yeah, instrumental for us. And then we just launched their gifting menu. So there are some of the you know, front end improvements that we've done that are working. Um, and we've done things that, that haven't and, and slowed the site down, but they're the ones that are really like, that have, have helped a lot. Great. And um, I guess it, one of the things that I found pretty interesting working with you guys and some of the other multi-brand retailers we've worked with um, has been kind of maybe like the co-marketing side and even like the on-site uh, kind of real estate management piece and kind of like how you work commercially with some of the brands. Um, so maybe you can talk a bit about that and kind of how you work with the brands from an activation perspective as well. Yeah. So... We have some of the best relationships with some of the biggest names in, in alcohol in like kind of top level wholesale level. So, you know, Diageo, Brown Foreman, um, Moet Hennessy a big, a big one. Um, and over the last three or four years, we've, we've run you know, small campaigns and then it's grown into, you know, a behemoth of kind of side business almost in terms of managing those activations. Um, because we have so many products, um, we need to be promoting certain things and make people aware that this new and amazing products there or well, this is 
making sure that that brand is relevant within the category. Um, so we get um, investment or partnership deals or you know, JBPs with with um, with these businesses, and then we we it's mainly for direct, but you know, kind of cluster that brand and that campaign throughout the site. And we've been over the last year trying to work out where else we can put the content. So we mentioned it in the search bar. So whenever we have an activation for like example Hennessy, if you search for Cognac, you search for Henny, you say you search for Cabozier, any of the, the the terms where Hennessy would be viable, we're showing that Hennessy manner for that new product or that campaign that we're doing. Um and it just you see such an like increase in that brand's um, sales, not just on the product that we're pushing, but also the, the whole cat the whole brand itself. So we did um Moa Hennessy recently did a you know, some data data work against our sales. We share our, our sales data with them. And they were like, whenever we run a campaign, even if we run it on a £30 bottle, we see all the um, prestige products fly as well. So you'll suddenly start selling bottles in um, Hennessy Parody or XO that were in promote, just made the brand more visible. Um, so yeah, as I say, we've, we've tried to work out how do we make the PLPs more visible. If you're on any PLP and you're prom promoting the two newest products that we're, we're trying to showcase or the, the campaign that we're running, navigation if it's in the relevant area we show making sure the campaign's there um that it's like we're a, a billboard for them because we're just promoting them like in the in their categories and it's it does a lot of it, and it's great for both people that you know, both sides of the business so great for us to get more sales and lines that we would have not necessarily have sold and it's great for the brand to get bigger exposure um while selling more stock to us it's kind of a win-win for everybody yeah, that makes sense. And uh, I think that whole side of like that whole piece is getting bigger and bigger. Like I was talking to someone the other day about ASOS's new ad network that the brands can use. Um, and obviously like Amazon have been doing that for years. But yeah, it's interesting how many brand sites are trying to monetize the traffic better and like use some of their traffic to like improve margin. Um, we I guess... Really scratched... Sorry, I was just saying we haven't really scratched the service on it to be fair. We've just done it from a direct point, but... Actually, we need to start looking at how do we do it in like paid advertising, how do we run ads in line with that? Yeah. If they're running a campaign for, because you'll see like, um, Glenn Rangie will do a campaign, like a billboard campaign saying, my saying to us, how do we do that? How do we be the, the partnership for, for that brand externally, not just internally? Uh, yeah. And we have also always looked at like sponsored positioning, but I think with what we talked about with the smart merchandising and boosting, we kind of already have that without having to kind of, start building some algorithm to map to start taking monetizing it but um in my personal it's that future makes sense and i guess on that topic um so obviously you and sham the kind of founder of the ball club um have about ten thousand ideas um what's next for the ball club like what are the things that you're going to roll out over the next 12 months um so we're rolling out a new app um, we were probably the first alcohol retailer, um, online retailer to to have dedicated um, iOS and Android app. Um, did great for us, brilliant for retention, great for direct communication with with um, with customers. Um, as much as we've optimised our mobile site and eight percent eight percent of our traffic is the mobile site, we still have a dedicated app because of that direct communication, because of retention, because of ease of use. If you buy from us regularly. Rather than signing in and having to manage your cookies, you just can go straight to the app. You've got your last order. You can manage everything from there. Um, and we used Tapcart originally, which is um, we were joined Tapcart when they just started. I think he must have told us about them. And, um, and it, it, it honestly was brilliant. It was great to be able to launch an app so quickly. Um, it proved its worth. It's more than made its return on investment. But what we realised now is it probably lacks a bit of the functionality that we built on site. So we want to maximise the the app. Um, what the app can do um so we've, the recipes that we've we've built we've built into the new app um because we want it to be as much of a reference and interactive app as it is a commerce app so that way if you you know you're not worried about i need to go buy something but i need to, i've got my friends over i want to see if i can make an agroni how do i make an agroni go to my bottle club app go to the recipes and like oh i actually haven't got your campari quick add to cart and just kind of circular experience uh, i've never had the map i've been aware of the map so that's I hope I never have that where I, where so I need Campari. Only you will. Well, that's, that's that happens you off where the Campari's down running low. 
No, it's normally the it's normally the whiskey that's very low in our house. Uh, yeah. But I, as you can imagine, my bar is pretty well stocked of some very random things. My friends love going over because it's going to be what we're going to make today. Um, recently tried an olive oil based cocktail, which was a bit strange, but it was good. Hey, um, I know I'm I'm looking forward to making a purchase when I have my six week no drinking zone ready for the summer. So it's going to be an interesting uh, so, browsing around your catalogue. Yeah, that, that's it. Here. We we stay on top of trends as well because of the common brand that we've built. So um, somebody told me the other day that there's a whole thing on TikTok at the moment around what they call clarified cocktails. So it's milk-based cocktails like pina coladas, but they're clarifying the milk and removing the curd. So they're actually like clear pina colada. Um, so you now I messaged the team. I was like, clarified cocktails, go find out some more about it. And then within an hour, I've got two recipes on site linked to the products. And it's just staying on top of things like that is kind of what makes the reason our business is that our team is so small is so we can remain agile or always thinking of a new best thing and expanding in different areas. Um, but to answer the rest of your question, um, yeah, we're watching the map, which we're super excited about. It might be a gimmick, but we think it's a really cool way of experience and discovering the products. I think after our conversation at the summit, Product discoverability is a huge thing, especially when you've got an article portfolio. So, what else can we do for product discoverability? Uh, we're then also looking at how we can, um, yeah, bring you more revenue from other channels rather than just what we're doing. So, we're looking at starting a, um, a B two B side of the business and a B two B experience. Um, looking at getting, getting corporate and concierge into it. So, with these high net worth clients, um, having a more personal experience with a with a concierge client manager um, and then also events so we've obviously got a great portfolio of products and we do a good job of promoting those products on site with reviews and uh, UGC and but the thing is it's better to go and taste those products which is the one thing that you can't do it's a bit like if you're a play the website you can try it on them and get a refund but we obviously can't do that with that so getting in front of customers directly and doing a tasting for example and saying you know this is the tequila event. Come down, try these five different tequilas, learn a bit more about it, build an affinity to the brand, and then get some brands involved in it as well so they can talk about it from their perspective. Um, they're kind of our focuses for the next 12 months. Um, but as Paul says, we've got 10,000 ideas, so that's just the ones we've capitalized oh, yeah. at the moment, but there'll probably be some more. Excellent. Um, look, it's been really, really interesting. Um, I mean, that, this is what I love about e-commerce. There's... A million and one things you can do, and everyone's focused in different areas. Um, and technology's changing all the time. So, look, Tim, really appreciate you taking the time to join us and share insights into how you're attacking e-commerce at the Bottle Club and where where you're going with it. And also, thanks everyone as always for listening in. We do appreciate it. Keep your ears open for next episode. We drop them every Tuesday, and don't forget to give us that rating on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you might be listening and watching. Take care, everybody. Until next time. For more information on this topic, head over to replatform.fm for our audio podcasts. To discuss a project, or if you'd like to chat about any of the topics covered in this episode in more detail, please reach out to myself, James Gerd, or my co-host, Paul Rogers, via LinkedIn and Twitter. Thanks again for listening, and keep your ears peeled for the next episode.